anytime, anything that is not forbidden is compulsory. Any interaction you don't see, that there's got to be a good reason why you don't see it. It violates some conservation law somehow. The fifth lecture I gave was about force and strong force. Uh, we started with the, uh, the discovery of lots and lots of masons and baryons, and we learned how you could fit them into patterns, and underneath these patterns, they could be explained because the particles that were being described were made up of quarks that were different flavors, and when you combine the quarks of different flavors and different arrangements, you get these pretty patterns of baryons and masons out. I also talked about the fact that the strong force confines color, by which I mean the, the quarks that are the quarks that are doing the interacting are colored objects, and that's what dictates the strong force. Uh, but the strong force is so strong that you will never in nature find an isolated colored object. And that's what I mean when I say it confines color. It confines it to combine with other colored objects so that the net object is colorless. If there's one thing I want you to remember from that lecture, it's the idea that anytime as scientists we see a lot of stuff that fits into pretty patterns, this is our sign that says there's something underneath the pattern that's giving it this structure. And that's a lot of the time that's what we do. We look for the pattern and then we look for what's causing it. The sixth lecture was about symmetry and unification. We talked a lot about the Higgs particle and how the Higgs potential, the potential energy associated with the Higgs field is such that it wants to settle into one value or another, and when it does that, it breaks an underlying symmetry of the system, so that even though the laws of physics underneath satisfy how the symmetry, the real world that we live in doesn't. And the symmetry that's being broken in that case is the symmetry between the electromagnetic force and the weak force. And furthermore, the, if there's one thing maybe you guys should take away from that lecture, it's the idea that the Higgs field winds up being some constant value field everywhere in the universe. And the way particles get mass is that as they travel through this field, they interact with the field at every point. And that interaction energy becomes mass, what we observe in our world as mass energy. The seventh, I guess, lecture, I talked about the problems with gravity and how string theory could provide a solution to them. I talked about uh, the black hole information paradox, and I talked about how gravity is the only force that direct that pairs what the total energy of the system is, as opposed to just measuring differences in energy. And that this meant that you had to care what the vacuum energy level was, and that was the cosmological constant problem. We talked about how gravity starts to break down at very high energies and very short distance scales, and about how strings were developed as a proposal for how to solve that. Because if you've got a problem with point-like objects at very short distance scales, the easiest idea of how to solve this is, well, let's not make the, the, the fundamental objects point like them. Let's give them some extent in space. And that's where the idea of strings comes from. If there's a lesson I want you to take away from that lecture, it's the original one that I intended on talking about before I decided to talk so much about gravity. It's the idea that if particles are little extended strings, this gives you a different way of getting structure. If, you know, the, the old paradigm was a bunch of different atoms make up the periodic table. They fall into these patterns, and that's because the atoms are made up of smaller objects inside them, protons and neutrons and electrons. Well, the protons and the neutrons, and along with all the other basic 
experience. And then that energy, again, from our external point of view, we just see that as some internal energy, so right away it's got to be mass. So what you see is you get one particle traveling in different ways in ten dimensions. From the four-dimensional point of view, it looks like a bunch of different particles of different masses. We also talked, and if there's one thing I want you guys to really take away from last week, we also talked about how if you change the number of dimensions you're in, or if you change the configuration of how they're wrapped up, you get different rule, you get sort of a different effective gravity. That the law for gravity we experience in our three plus one dimensional world is a direct consequence of the fact that we live in three spatial dimensions. The one over r squared law for gravity is a geometrical fact. And if you change the number of dimensions you live in, you should change that law as well. And therefore, if you want to look for extra dimensions, dimensions at a short distance scale, what you really want to look for is a change at very short distances in how the gravitational law affects things. Is it really 1 over r squared at really, really short distance scales? Or is it something else? And that brings us to today. Uh, today's lecture is special to my heart because this is actually what I do. This is, of all the lectures I've given, the most related to my area of interest, my research. So the topic of today is strength and the strong force. It is an entirely different way to think about strings, an entirely difficult, different way to use strings in terms of a picture of how the real world works. Now, for those of you history buffs, I gave you this beautiful story about how strings are the most obvious solution to this problem of short distance scales, and therefore it's a, a natural consequence of this problem. Well, that's not where string theory actually came from. Historically, string theory was first proposed not in terms of a solution to gravity, but instead as an explanation for the strong force. This was in the days before we knew about quarks. This was the 1960s. We had mesons and baryons, and we had studied those, and we needed to try to understand how they worked. And the idea was that mesons, instead of being a combination of one quark and one anti-quark, were actually a little open string a little extended object. So let's talk about this for a little bit. Well, just to review, we had these beautiful patterns of mesons that were observed. They formed these uh, sets of nine, of which I'm really only showing you eight in each set here. And this is what led us to the idea of quarks, because the, the different flavors of quarks explain how they fall into these patterns. Now, there's a thing that I think I may have mentioned briefly. There are a lot more mesons than I'm showing you on the board right now. There's a, there's a book called the, the group called the Particle Data Group that publishes data, uh, statistics on observed particles. And there's literally, I don't know, 100 pages on various mesons that have been observed out there in the experiments. Most of them are much, much less stable, much, much more massive than these guys. And it turns out that these pretty uh, hexagons are not the only patterns that you can make out of the mesons that we observe in the real world. For example, you can create families of mesons that have different spins and different masses, but other than that, act very, very similar to each other interact in very similar ways with all the same particles. And if you try to combine these particles in families, you can graph. They have different masses and they have different spins. And you can graph the particle's mass squared versus its spin. And you get these pretty linear relationships. See, the omega and the rho particles are guys that we've had seen before, there they are, the omega and the rho. They're the first particles on this trajectory. But there's another set of particles that are called the A2 and the F2 that are of higher mass. 
and they're spin two particles. And then there's another set of particles called the omega-3 and the rho-3 that are spin three, and they have a higher mass. And then there's another set of particles up here that are the A4 and the F4. Those are spin four particles, and they have even higher mass. And if you plot them against each other, you get this very not a coincidence looking line. So this line is called a Reggie trajectory, and I want to explore what could cause it. Well, strings have exactly the right property to create these lines of particles. Now, if you'll remember, we have we explained particles of different masses as arising from strings because they have different numbers of wiggles. More wiggles means more inter internal energy, and more internal energy means higher mass. So you get a pattern of a lower mass particle, and then the next up, and then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. But at the same time, if you increase the number of wiggles on the particle, then those wiggles tend to be spinning around, and they have some angular momentum associated with them. And that's internal angular momentum. So you also get particles of increasing spin at the same time. So this relationship between you have a particle of a, of a low mass and a low spin, and then you have a next up particle with a higher mass and a higher spin, and then you keep going, this is exactly what you would expect if the object was really one string with a variety of different number of wiggles on it. And in fact, it gives you exactly a line. It gives you an exact linear relationship. That's what is predicted by string theory. And this idea was the first thing that made physicists want to think about strings. They looked at these resonant trajectories of mesons and they said, aha, I know what will cause that. These mesons are little open strings. And an open string is just a string where it, that has two ends, whereas a closed string is a little loop. Now, there's another thing that we know about string, about little open strings. Well, in the old, in the picture that we've been talking about, mesons are formed of a quark and an anti-quark. And if you draw the strong field lines between them, what you find is that unlike electrodynamics, where the field lines spread out as you get further away from the charged particle, in the case of the strong force, the field lines don't spread out at all. They stay very close together, and they form what's called a flux tube, a tube of strong force field between the two mesons. And this is, in terms of the core picture, a way of understanding why the strong force doesn't decrease with distance because the density of lines as you get further out is still the same. Well, if you draw this little flux tube and you get far away from it, it looks a lot like a little string, right? You've got an endpoint, and an endpoint, and this tube of stuff, and maybe it's not exactly one-dimensional the way a string should be, but from far away it looks pretty good, right? Well, we also know that in terms of the quark picture, as we pull, tr if we tried to pull a meson apart, we would have to put more and more energy into the system. But because the strong force increases with distance, the, the further away we wanted to get, we would have to put more and more energy into the system until finally we put so much energy into the system that it was cheaper for a new pair of part quark and anti quark to form in the middle and for the little mason to split into two masons and come apart. Well, that's a great story, but I could also explain it in terms of an open string. Here's my open string. I pull on either end of it. I pull, I pull, I pull. What happens when I break a string in half? Do I get one end of the string and the other end of the string? I get two little strings, right? So that's, you know, and so suddenly I have two mesons again. That's another way of seeing how the open string is a good explanation for what we observe in meson behavior. There's a third part of this. Well, 
The first time I ever brought up the meson, I brought up the pion. And I brought it up in the context of interactions between protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Remember, we were talking about the nuclear force, and we were talking about how it decreased very, very strongly with distance, and how this was associated with having a massive mediator particle. And you can predict the mass of this mediator particle from the way the, strong, the nuclear force decreases with distance. And it corresponds very, very closely to the mass of the pion. And this is what led Hideki Yukawa to predict the existence of the pion. Well, proton and neutron interactions are explained by these changes of pions. It turns out that those are not the only particles that you can exchange and create something that looks like the nuclear force. They can also exchange other mesons. And in general, if you have an interaction between two particles that can be explained by the exchange of the first particle on a trajectory, those two particles can also exchange these guys, and these guys, and these guys, and so on. Right here, I don't have the pi on trajectory. There is one. I just didn't happen to put it up there. Well, what that means is that not only can the proton and the neutron exchange a pion, they can also exchange the next particle up on the pion's trajectory. And they can exchange the next particle after that, and so on. And if you want to take into account the full effect, then you have to sum over all of the possible exchanged particles. And here I've drawn the pion as being this plum-colored line. And the next guy up is green, and the next guy up is yellow, and so on. Well. There's another picture that explains this. Suppose instead we have a string theory interaction and the object being exchanged is an open string, which, you know, if you stretch out an open string in time, it maps out like a sheet. There's a little open string that's traveling between here and here. Well, the little open string inside the, the virtual open string that's being exchanged can have any number of wiggles on it it wants because we never directly observe it. It's a virtual string, so we never observe exactly which meson it is. And because of that, it can take into account all of these different possibilities in one. And if you work this out mathematically, it turns out to be a very
understood is the, the most controlled particle interaction story that we have. Well, we had the exchange of a photon between two electrons explaining the electromagnetic force between them. But it's also possible for these two electrons to exchange one photon and then to exchange a second photon. Perfectly valid. In fact, you know, if all you measure is the incoming electrons and then the outgoing electrons, you don't really know what happened here in the middle. It's possible that they did exchange two photons instead of one. Well, for quantum electrodynamics, this is less likely than this. The emission of a photon is an unlikely event. Statistically, it has some probability that's less than one. And if you try to exchange two photons, you get an even less likely event. Now, there are even more complicated things that could happen, but this one's a really, really unlikely event. And because of that, you can organize what probably occurred in terms of, well, these, the, this is the most likely things, and then this set are the next most likely, and then this set are the next most likely. And mathematically, this allows us to sort of get control of the calculations, and we don't sit there drawing all sorts of crazy pictures and then calculating exactly every diagram, because there are an infinite number of ways it can happen, and that would make us all very crazy. Well, in the strong force, unfortunately, the strong force is so strong that it turns out that the more complicated the diagram is, the more emissions of gluons that you have and virtual quarks and virtual gluons, the more likely the diagram is to have occurred. So if you want to try to draw the most likely thing that could happen, you're going to be sitting there drawing little exchanges of gluons for the rest of your life. I, of course, have just drawn a few here. I call this kind of thing a netting. It looks like you're trying to create some sort of a mosquito net out of the interaction. Well, I have a quark coming in and a quark coming out and an anti-quark coming in and an anti-quark coming out. That's why I drew the arrows in the opposite directions. It looks like I've got a meson coming in and a meson coming out. And if you have a particle, I'm going to go old school for a second. If you have a particle and you draw its path in time, you draw a line, right? If you have a string and you draw its path in time, you draw a sheet, right? Think of this netting as being an approximate sheet. The more dense the netting gets as you draw it, the closer you get to this picture, the further away from the exchanges of individual particles, and the closer to just one string traveling through time, tracing out a sheet. Well, this is a way of sort of, in terms of individual particle interactions, it's a way of connecting this picture to this one, really. Now, there's another way of thinking about this. Remember that quarks carry color. Each quark carries one unit of color. And gluons also carry color. I said that a gluon carries a unit of color and a unit of anti-color. Now, in this picture, I've drawn exactly the same crazy netting object, only I've replaced a, every quark with a single line with an arrow on it, representing the flow of one unit of color. And I've replaced every gluon, there's a gluon, with a pair of lines with arrows in opposite directions. So what I'm trying to draw in this picture is where the color goes. Color is a conserved quantity, just the same way electromagnetic force is. So the arrows don't just stop in midair. You can, you can trace out exactly where the color goes. You can get this very complicated picture. Uh, you'll notice that the incoming quarks and the outgoing quarks have a definite color, but in between you get all these little closed loops. And I could have chosen to draw that any color I wanted 
and I'd still get a valid diagram. So, for example, this line right here is actually a quark, and the quark between this interaction and this interaction could be either red, green, or blue. And as long as I continuously draw this, this line for the rest of it the same color, it's still a perfectly valid little picture. Well, every closed loop in the middle can be any color you want. Uh, you're, you're trying, you're, you're, so the gluons are not colorless, remember. No glue. I mean, the whole point of the gluon is that it's not colorless. If it was, then they wouldn't interact with other gluons. So, I mean, in fact, you don't want it to be colorless. Um, well, in QCD, there are three. Again on the equator, then all of these angles are 90 degrees. And I add up the angles that make up this triangle, and I get 270 degrees, which is a lot larger than 180. And in general, if you draw any triangle on the surface of a sphere, you'll get, and you add up the angles, you'll get a number that's greater than 180. Well, a space with negative curvature, you draw the triangle and you get less than 180 degrees. So that's sort of a good way of thinking about what negative curvature is. It works the triangle in the opposite direction. It's also, it's, it's like a sphere only with negative curvature. The compact five space is a five dimensional sphere. This is in some ways the simplest possibility you can kind of imagine a sphere is a very, very symmetric object. You rotate it in any direction, and if by any amount you get back to where you started, it's got, it's, of all the five-dimensional shapes you could draw that are compact, the sphere is the simplest in some sense. It has the highest amount of symmetry. The four plus one-dimensional anti-decider is also the simplest non-compact space you could kind of imagine drawing. And the result is that the QCD-like theory is very, very simple. It's not as complicated as QCD actually is. The particle theory has a huge amount of symmetry. For example, <coughs> supersymmetry means that you have just as many fermions as you do bosons. And they all have the same masses as each other. This QCD-like theory has a lot of supersymmetry. 
five plus one dimensions, surely, we, you know, four plus one dimensions, surely we prefer three plus one dimensions. That's the real world. Not if there's no experiment that can tell the difference. Yes? I read somewhere that Dirac um, unified Heisenberg's uh, matrix picture of quantum mechanics with Schrodinger's wave picture of quantum mechanics by saying they weren't really conflicting theories. There are two different equivalent representations of something more abstract like linear operators. And that makes me wonder if you're saying that QCD and string theory are two equivalent representations of something more abstract. I have no idea what that would be. This is a, this is a, a good question. Uh, that is certainly what we believe. However, in the case of the Heisenberg the wave picture of quantum mechanics and the matrix picture of quantum mechanics, mathematicians can show you exactly why these theories are precisely equivalent. You can mathematically draw a line between everything in this, on this side and everything on this side and show that they are really precisely the same. If I could do that for QCD and string theory, I'd be a happy girl. <laughs> And I'd have a Nobel Prize, yes. <laughs> yes? I asked Roger Penrose whether uh, string theory was a falsification of uh, actual physics, particularly his crystal uh, hypotheses. And he said yes. I have no idea what you mean by that question. <laughs> uh, string theory is not a falsification of anything. String theory is a theory. Falsification happens in the laboratory when you disprove a theory. As far as I know, we haven't disproven string theory. It is in conflict with other theories. For example, twister theory might, you know, there might be some aspects of twister theory. On the other hand, there are plenty of string theorists who work with tw twister theory as a mathematical description of strings. So, I'm not sure Roger Penrose and I agree on that point. <coughs> yes? Yes, they're in the back. 
is that it's possible to have two entirely different mathematical theories that describe the same physical system. And if there's no experiment that can tell you which one is better than the other, then you have to admit that they're both equally right. Yes? Is that you could, if the spin, if the wave is traveling twice as fast, 
need one bump on the, on the string in order to get a spin of two.